The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, let's start. start. Uh, so let me just mention uh, brief. Uh, first, let me just mention briefly uh, this uh, story regarding the deep brain and the Higgs mechanism, uh, which we uh, di discussed at the end of last lecture. So there was a PSAT problem uh, which was related to this. Um, yes, yeah, so I expected maybe the PSAT problem was a little bit tough because we did not go to many details. Uh, we did not go to many details. Um, um, yeah, so in grading we will be very um, Flexible because we, um, um, yeah. But it, 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 so let me just say a few more things about that, just to make sure. Uh, um, yeah. So here is the say the uh, uh, the action. If you have n, say if you suppose you have n d brains together, and then in such case, so this is the only effective action for the massless degree freedom uh, on the d brain. So which you have a gauge field, which is a matrix, and then you also have a, 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 a scalar field, a number of scalar fields, uh, which are also n by n matrices. And the, the number of scalar field is the same as the number of transverse dimensions. Okay? And we also discussed that the, uh, the, uh, the scalar fields can be considered as, be, uh, as describing the transverse dynamics of the brain. Say, say, let's consider you have a case of a, uh, yeah, let's consider you have a single, single brain, and uh, there's only one transverse direction. Say, let's call it, uh, uh, um, say, uh, the, uh, the phi direction. Uh, uh, there's only one direction, say, uh, phi one direction. Uh, 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 then, the, the essentially location of the brain, the essentially uh, uh, the expectation value of phi one uh, can be considered, say, yeah, suppose this is a direction of x one. Uh, and the corresponding scalar field is phi one, and then, then the expectation value of phi one can be considered as the location uh, of the brain, and uh, and this phi is the string which uh, uh, ending on this brain and come back to itself. Okay. So now let's consider if you have two brains. Uh, uh, now consider you have n brains. Again, we have only one transverse direction, uh, and now have n brains. Uh, uh, with one transverse direction, which uh, again just x1. And now you can just separate them. So now let's consider the process which you separate this m brain into, say, completely separate them in different locations. Say, uh, so this is x1, x2, to xn. Okay? To xm. So, so this situation can be considered as a situation. So in this case, the phi is a, a, a phi is n by n matrices, and then this can be considered as phi having an expectation value, which is only in the diagonal entry. Okay, which is only in the diagonal entry, uh, uh, and each diagonal entry uh, 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 describes the location of the uh, uh, each deep brain. And it's natural to think that why this is a diagonal entry, because the diagonal entry uh, describes the string which ending on the brain itself. Okay? So this is a 1-1 one, one, uh, one, one string, and this is a 2-2 two, two string, and an n string. And so the diagonal string uh, 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 is the excitation on the brain itself. And the off-diagonal degree freedom corresponding to essentially corresponding to excitation uh, between the string between the brains. And so it's natural that the location of the brain and then just corresponding to the uh, uh, diagonal entries, okay? And so, uh, uh, so now we can generalize to, to the general uh, dimensions. Now there are more, uh, now suppose there are two transverse dimensions, okay? Suppose now there are two transverse dimensions, let me call x1, x2. And then now you have two scalar fields. So now the story is a little bit uh, 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 more complicated because when you have two transverse directions, Say, if you have more than two transverse directions, now you have a non trivial potential term. And uh, under the allowed configuration, say, suppose that phi have low space time dependence, then allowed configuration, say the, uh, so the, uh, say, the minimum of the potential 
the mass force corresponding to the configuration which the commutator of phi n and phi b to be zero. For, for all, all, say, say uh, right now, uh, uh, we just uh, two have trans, say, say we have two transverse directions, so we only have two, okay? But you can uh, generalize to any number of transverse directions, okay? So that means that the phi, all the phi corresponding, uh, all the scalar field, they have to commute with each other. That means they can be simultaneously diagonalized. OK, that means they're uh, simultaneously diagonalized. Then that means we can choose a basis. Then we can choose a basis. Say if I write phi, uh, the, the collection of all the, uh, all the d brains, then I can simultaneously diagonalize them. And, uh, and then they have the following form. OK, so, so each x. So each x1 corresponding to, so each vector corresponding to, yeah, say, uh, for example, here uh, is x1. Yeah, I should uh, use a different notation. So let me call the space time y1, y2. And, uh, and say this is x2, et cetera. So, so this defines the configuration which you have one d brain here and one d brain at this point and at x3 and et cetera. OK? And again, uh, it's only the diagonal entry. Uh, I describe the location of the d brains. Uh, the diagonal entry describe the location of d brains. And these, because they're, uh, uh, because they're all diagonal, and the commutator is zero, and these are the allowed configurations. Okay? So, uh, so this is a very important lesson. It tells you that even you have a potential, still the d brain, you can put it anywhere you want. And you have the freedom uh, to put the d brain. Uh, you don't break translation symmetry. Okay? Uh, any more qu uh, any questions on this? Of course, when you say uh, when the scalar field develops expectation such uh, uh, such expectation value, and then your original U N gauge symmetry is broken, and then broken the uh, uh, broken into the uh, just in the standard story. Uh, uh, um, yeah, to whatever subgroup allowed by this. Uh, um, yeah. So if all the x1, uh, are the, uh, if all of them are, uh, are different, then you only, then the remaining just u1 to the power n. Because now you have just have uh, uh, each brain separated, then you just have u1 to the power n. Okay? Good? Okay. So, so now let's uh, um, move to new stuff. So now let's say a little bit about the D-brains in superstring theory. So what we said so far actually applies to D-brains uh, in both uh, a bosonic string and in superstring. So now let's say a little bit more about the D-brains. So as we discussed before, when we quantize the open string, that the deep brains in bosonic stream always have a tachyon, always have an open string tachyon. No matter what deep brain you have, because the, as we discussed before, the quantization, the zero point energy on the string is the same, uh, no matter which dimension of the brain is, et cetera. And so you always have an open string tachyon. Uh, uh, tachyon. So that means, so as we said before, tachyon means that you are sitting, if you have a, if you have a scalar field, which have a negative mass square, that means you you're essentially sitting at the top of the potential, uh, in the top of some potential. And so that's why you get the negative mass square. And so that means you have, uh, 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 this is an unstable configuration. Because the, if you, say, give the tachyon a little bit of valve, then the tachyon wants to roll down, 
and then, uh, then you move away from this configuration, okay? Uh, you move away from this configuration. So when you go to superstream, so we also discussed before that for the, uh, for the bosonic stream, the closed stream sector also has a tachyon. And then you can get rid of those tachyons by, uh, by going to the superstream, okay? So similarly, uh, uh, go, uh, going to the superstream, the deep brains of certain dimensions not for all dimensions but only only for some dimensions do not have tachyons so they are stable so their lowest modes are just a, a, a massless mode. They don't have lactyl mass square modes. Okay. Uh, and uh, um, in particular, in particular, so this I will. Uh, uh, this is a long story. Uh, this is a somewhat long story, which I will not explain here. Uh, uh, but I will just uh, uh, make the statement. In particular, you you can show that for those stable deep brains in superstring, they always carry a conserved charge. Always carry a conserved charge. So I will explain uh, where does this conserved charge come from. And they always carry some conserved charge, uh, which, is, which is also a reason why they are stable. And the second feature is that the, the, the world volume theory It's supersymmetric. Okay, supersymmetric. So in addition to this A phi, so in addition to this A, this A alpha phi, we are looking at here. So in addition to A alpha and phi A, which we already see in the bosonic string, they are also massless fermions. So, so the open string excitations also include the massless fermions. Uh, uh, they also include massless fermions. And in particular, the, on, the low energy series of the, all of them together it's a supersymmetric version of this. It's a super Yamil series, a supersymmetric version of this. And it's some kind of super Yamil series. Okay. Super Yamil series. Uh, so now let me um, let me elaborate a little bit on the first point that they carry a conserved charge, okay? Now let me elaborate uh, a little bit on the first point. So um, let me go to the one, elaborate more on one. So let me just remind you again, the bosonic part of the bosonic part of masses closed superstring spectrum. which we briefly mentioned before. So this is so-called the type two string, so-called type two string. Yeah, when I say the super string, I always mean type two string, okay? So, so if you quantize the super string, then you find that there again, you find the metric, you find the, a graviton, then you find that there's a uh, anti-symmetric tensor, and you find that there's a scalar field, just as what we did in the uh, in the bosonic stream. But but there are some additional uh, uh, massless modes. Depend on your condensation or how you treat the fermions in the superstring, then there can be say two A or two B. 
there are two types of superstring. And the one, and, the, and the for 2A, you have one additional one form field and the additional three form field. Okay? Uh, and for 2B, you have additional scalar fields and additional two form fields and additional four form fields. Okay. In particular, uh, 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 this is so called self dual. Uh, I, I, I will explain uh, uh, that a little bit. Uh, in the 2B container, self dual or four form. And this, this additional field are called the Ramon Ramon field, typically. Just a name uh, uh, called the Ramon Ramon field. Uh, and so these are called the Ramon Ramon field. Okay? Uh, C1, C3? Uh, C1, C3, that's right. Uh, they're all called the Ramon Ramon field. Yeah. So the story is essentially the same, very similar as what we did. For the bosonic string, for the bosonic string, you only have x uh, on the word sheet. When you quantize x, then you find the graviton, you find the dot b, you find the phi. And in the super string, you put some additional fermions on the word sheet, and those fermions give you additional modes, and then you will uh, uh, have those additional, uh, uh, that will also give rise to additional massless modes in the space time, and, uh, and those are these uh, uh, Ramon Ramon fields, okay? Um, uh, also, there are, there are also massless fermions, which I will not write here. Yes? So why is it that type 2A and type 2B string theory, I mean, it, they appear to be very, very different, which, which seems bad. It just seems like there's this arbitrary choice about how you go about doing mathematics, and you get this spectrum of particles or this spectrum. So how do you get around this problem? Um, this is not the problem. This is a fact of life. Um, okay. <laughs> this is just what you find. <laughs> this is just what you find. So, so which one is right? Uh, 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 um, um, they both can be right, uh, and they both can be wrong. And, uh, and our, our goal is just to find all possible theories are there. And, uh, and, uh, and these are just allowed quantizations. A lot consists in the quantizations. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and the both, both of them give you consistent quantum gravity. Hmm. And uh, if I have time, if this is a string theory class, uh, if this were a string theory class, <laughs> then I would explain that actually, uh, secretly, they are equivalent. Secretly, they are equivalent. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, so, uh, so in some sense, uh, they're not that different. Okay, anyway, for our purpose at the perturbative level, uh, 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 when we consider the coupling, string coupling to be small, then, then they appear to be different. Uh, 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 and uh, yeah, uh, we have two types of string theory, okay? And so let me mention a little bit uh, uh, those forms. So this and, uh, all these are anti-symmetric potentials. So these anti-symmetric potentials are generations of the, uh, uh, of the Maxwell field. Of the Maxwell field, A mu, okay? So, so mathematically, you can write the, uh, 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 say for example, mathematically you can write the gauge field, A mu, as a so-called one form so-called one form, and then uh, a mu is just coefficient of this uh, one form. And then, and then the field strains is just the derivative, it's just the exterior derivative of this one form. And then the, uh, uh, the Lagrangian will be just minus one quarter f mu mu, f mu mu, okay, construct from this uh, procedure, okay? So you can just general, uh, mathematically straightforward to generalize these two higher dimensional forms. So for example, we can consider n form 
which is the uh, uh, n component tensor. But all indices are fully antisymmetric with each other. Okay, so all the indices are fully antisymmetric with each other. So these are fully antisymmetric. Okay, depending on the convention, sometimes we also put the one over n factorial here. Okay. Anyway, uh, uh, um, so so you can define such an object, such as the generation of A, and the corresponding field strains for the C. We also called F. So we call. Uh, it, so the field strength for C is just a n plus one form, which is the exterior derivative of D C. Okay. And then this is the n plus one form. Again, this is a fully anti-symmetric tensor now with n plus one indices. Okay. And then you can write down your Lagrangian. Similarly, by by generalizing this. You can write as one over. And maybe let me write it here. You can write it Lagrangian as minus one over half times m factorial. Two times m factorial, not two m factorial. Two times m factorial, f mu one, mu m plus one, f mu one, mu m plus one. Okay. So f is a two form. Uh, uh, f is m plus one form. So, uh, so it's a tensor with m plus one indices, uh, a fully anti-symmetric, fully anti-symmetric. And those fields, so so those fields are essentially uh, uh, have this kind of structure, okay? Essentially have this kind of structure, and uh, say it's so a one form is not, uh, uh, is very similar to our Maxwell. So this is a three form, and this is a scalar, uh, 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 then just a massive scalar. Then this is a two form uh, whose field strength will be a three form, and then this is a four form, etc. Okay. And uh, just by definition, just like here, there's a gauge symmetry because f equal to dA. Here, because this is f equal to dC, so there's a gauge symmetry. Because I can add Cn, the total derivative of any n plus one, n minus one form. Okay, so I can make a gauge symmetry. So, so, so lambda n minus one can be any n minus one form. And because of this square equal to zero, then f is invariant. Okay. So f n plus one is invariant. So if you put this into here, and because this is the uh, because this is already a total derivative, and so so f is invariant. Um, so um, so there's a gauge symmetry. Then there will be a conserved charge, say associated with those uh, uh, m forms. Okay. Uh, uh, you can define conserved charge associated with those m forms. So, so far, any questions? So, uh, yes. Uh, maybe so. This uh, C field uh, does it denote uh, fermions or bosons? Bosons. It's all bosons. But uh, it looks uh, you. Uh, uh, so this anti-symmetric has nothing to do with the fermions. No, uh, this is just the indices. Uh, uh, this is just indices, which is anti-symmetric. This is not the. Uh, uh, this is not the uh, location, space-time location. Yeah, this is just indices. It's the same thing as in the FMU. In the FMU, the indices are anti-symmetric. Yeah, it's the same thing here. Right. And are people comfortable with this differential form notation? Yes. <coughs> Those are bosons? They're all bosons. Where are they? Hmm? Sorry? H, B, and 
where are their proportions? Oh, they're so far that I did not write them down. So they are also fermionics. They're also massless fermions. Yeah, we will not worry. Uh, we will not need to worry about them. So there are massless fermions in this. Can you give me the case where this R R cubes came from? The H B and D was kind of quantized. Right. Yeah, those just come from uh, because uh, um, when you go to the superstring, you have additional fermions on the water sheet. And then they can give you additional uh, amasses modes, essentially come from them. Yeah, the story, the real story is a little bit more complicated because actually in the superstring, even those come from those fermions, uh, uh, water sheet fermions. Uh, yeah, but anyway, uh, 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 because you have add fermions to the water sheet, then you have more, more possibilities, then that gives rise to those modes. Yes, uh, uh, that's the rough story. But that modes are also for bosons, not for fermions. No, these are all, these are all the space-time bosonic fields, yeah. which are low energy excitations of the strings. And uh, they, how they arise on the watt sheet, uh, whether they come from fermions or from bosons, on the watt sheet, it's a separate issue. Yeah. And uh, in fact, all of them uh, actually arise from what sheet fermions, uh, uh, but they're space-time bosons. Yes? Uh, I could ask for the speed or the speed of, of these um, Ramon. Um, yeah, uh, uh, you, you, you just work out their, uh, uh, their representations under the, um, under the uh, 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 say, Lorentz symmetry. Oh, okay. It's not yeah. like, say, it's not like they're all integer spin. They're all integer spin. They're all integer spin representations of the Lorentz group, and uh, uh, not like fermions, then would be half integer. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're generating representations of the rotational group. Yeah. So 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 they are like a, a spin two spins. No, no. Normally we don't call them spin two or spin three. When we uh, uh, when we call spin two. We mean the uh, uh, fully symmetric indices, symmetric oh, and trace list. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't call them spin. Uh, uh, yeah, but mm, yeah, just the uh, uh, representation of Lorentz group. It's uh, yeah, it's it just some representations oh, okay. uh, uh, with integer. Um, yeah. Good. And uh, in the case of the Maxwell, we know that for the one form. For the, uh, for the case of the Maxwell, its source, we are familiar with, its a source is a point particle. Okay? So we can, we can couple the, so the point particle interact, say, with this external uh, 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 vector potential in the following way. So suppose a particle following some trajectory uh, described by, uh, by x mu tau, and then, and then this particle will interact with this gate, uh, uh, this uh, uh, vector potential in the following way. This is uh, familiar from E and M. Uh, so you just integrate essentially this A along the trajectory uh, 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 of the particle. And you can write it, it, this in the more compact mathematical form you just say you integrate along the trajectory, and, they, and A is a one form, and you just integrate this one form along the trajectory. Okay? And uh, so this is, uh, 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 um, say, it's so called pullback of this one form A to C. Okay? To C. Okay? Yeah, so this is the mathematical language. Um, um, um. Yeah, similarly, you can generalize to these higher dimensional forms. So, so one form naturally coupled to a point particle, which can be considered as a zero dimensional object. So a P plus one form P plus one form, then naturally then 
yeah, uh, uh, I should say the following. Then a p-dimensional object the naturally couples, just as a generalization of this, couples to a p plus 1 form. OK? As follows, you can just, you say, so uh, 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 the world volume of a p-dimensional object is the surface of p plus 1 dimension, OK? So the world volume uh, uh, of uh, uh, a p-dimensional object is uh, uh, p plus 1 dimension because there's also time. You also move in the, uh, it's a p-dimensional object moving in the time, then it's a p plus 1 dimension. So let me call that world volume sigma. And then the natural generation of this will, will be this, uh, 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 the coupling between a, two dimension, uh, a p dimensional object to a p plus 1 form uh, will be like this. Just so you integrate this p plus 1 form on the world volume uh, 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 of this p dimensional object. OK? And again, this is the pullback. of C to sigma, OK? P plus 1 to sigma. And, uh, and let me just write it in a more explicit form. So here I use a tau to parameterize the trajectory along the word 9. So here let me use psi to parameterize the word volume coordinate of uh, 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 this brain. Then, then this pullback means mu 1, mu p plus 1, partial x mu 1, partial psi 1, partial x mu p plus 1, partial psi p plus 1. And x mu, psi 1, psi 0, to psi p, uh, um, describe the embedding of sigma in space time. Any questions on this? So it tells you that, yeah, so this just tells you that the, uh, um, Well, there is a KC1 to KC P plus 1, but there is KC0 to KC P. Oh. Like Good. Notation. Maybe just do 0. Yes, so here the, uh, the the p-dimensional object in the simple case is just like the, the point particle is a zero-dimensional right. object. That's so that's right. what the object is. That's okay. right. That's right. Yeah. So, so yeah, uh, the zero-dimensional object naturally coupled to one form in this way. And then a p-dimensional object naturally co uh, coupled to p plus one dimensional this way. OK. OK, so, so let me just, just like in the, in the mass square case, the gauge symmetry here, the gauge symmetry here Im it implies that like electric charge is conserved, OK? Uh, the electric charge is conserved. So for, for p-dimensional object, coupled to a p plus 1 dimensional form. Uh, and because of this gauge symmetry, and, uh, and this charge is also conserved. OK? Uh, 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 and this charge is uh, also conserved. In particular, uh, the object with the minimal charge must be a stable object, OK? Because there's nothing to decay to. OK? OK, so again, as a generalization, of this case, so in the standard story, in the standard electromagnetism, we can have an electric charged particle. We can also have a magnetic charged particle. OK, we can have a um, magnetic charged particle. Um, in particular, you can, um, 
uh, um, talk about the magnetic monopole in quantum mechanics and etc. even though we have not observed them. Even though we have not observed them. So similarly, one can generalize that concept to, to higher dimensions. So let me uh, ju uh, first just remind you uh, uh, how we define uh, the magnetic, so mathematical way how we define the mathematically charged object in E and M. So E and M, so because F is a two form, okay, we can dualize F, so this is a Hodge dual. We can define another form, which I call F tilde, which is related to original F by, by a Hodge dual. So this is a two form. The Hodge dual of a two form in the four dimension is another two form. And then, then I can write it as uh, 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 the uh, 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 total derivative of the uh, 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 of a lot of one form potential. And then the then the object. So you know that uh, uh, under this dual, the so f zero one is mapped to f tilde two three. So electric field is mapped to magnetic field, and uh, similarly the magnetic field here is mapped to the electric field here. Okay. So under this Hodge dual, okay, under this Hodge dual, yeah, uh, uh, I should not just write just write this. So after some minor sign, we'll not uh, uh, keep track of, and uh, uh, under this uh, uh, Hodge dual, essentially say the electric field. Uh, now I call magnetic field, okay. So now object. Coupled to a tilde. Then it's magnetic charged. Okay, magnetic charged. Because the because the uh, 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 in terms of a tilde, such objects say we generate electric field, and from the our original f point of view is a magnetic field. Okay, so there will be a magnetic charged object. So uh, essentially, that's how we think about the magnetic monopole in E and M. So this can also be generalized to this uh, uh, M-form case. So one can also dualize, dualize an M-form. Okay. Is that we introduce another C tilde? Which is the dual of DC. So DC is the field strength for C. So it's, suppose this is M form. And, uh, and the DC is a, dual, uh, is a field strength of uh, 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 C. And then I do a hot dual. And then, uh, 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 then I define it to be DC tilde. Okay? Uh, I define it to be DC tilde. And, uh, and the DC tilde, uh, so this has M. So this is the M form. When you do a field strength become m plus one form, and when you do the Hodge dual, take uh, 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 when you take a Hodge dual, take a, the Hodge dual of m form is d minus n. Okay, so so this is d minus n minus two. Okay, so so this. Should be, dimin uh, should be a d minus n minus 2 form because when you take the d, then that makes it into d minus n minus 1 form. And this Hodge dual, take this n plus 1 form into d minus n minus 1 form. OK? So, so you map an n form to a d minus n minus 2 form. Uh, uh, this uh, 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 this. So essentially, it's the uh, generation of the electric magnetic dual uh, uh, of E and M. OK? So now, now, it's, now you can couple a d minus m minus 3 dimensional object to c tilde, OK, to c tilde. And in terms of C, in terms of original C, 
So this is a magnetic object, OK? This is a magnetic object. Just the same as uh, we define magnetic, uh, magnetic object or magnetic monopole for, um, for E and M. So is this clear? Yes? Um, in order to write F tilde as P A tilde, do we have to assume that there are no electric charges present? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, um, no, no, you don't have to. Um, um, so, so you do this, you have to assume that the equation motion is satisfied. And you have to assume equation motion is satisfied, then you can write this procedure. Yeah. So, but if. If D F is equal to J and yeah. that is non-zero, so if there are like yeah, uh, so you have exactly the similar situation with E and M. Uh, it's it just identical situation with E and M. Uh, it's just whatever you do in the E and M, you do it here. So I, I thought that we could only write F equals to D A because there were no magnetic forces. Uh, no, so so you can do that. Now you have to introduce some singularity. Uh, 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 so that's why the uh, magnetic monopole have a Dirac string. Uh, 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 that's why the magnetic monopole have a Dirac string. Then you have this Dirac condensation condition, etc. So you would then say either in E and M or in the in the uh, in the quantum mechanics, say in the graduate quantum mechanics, or or, or, or E and M. Um, so are people familiar with the concept of magnetic monopole and the Dirac, so-called Dirac string and Dirac condensation condition? Uh, I saw some uh, uh, loading head. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, so you're not familiar with it, and uh, look at, for for example, uh, uh, in in one chapter of Jackson, uh, uh, have a very uh, detailed discussion of magnetic monopoles, and uh, um, but the best actually was Dirac's original paper. Uh, it was really beautiful, uh, very very beautiful. Uh, yeah, but Jackson has a, a rather pedagogic uh, uh, discussion. Yeah, Jackson's in actual, in actual dynamics has a uh, rather, yeah. Wait, does he discuss <laughs> differential forms though or no? Uh, I don't remember. You mean Jackson? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the fact that you, you can allow the magnetic monopole, uh, uh, then if you allow the certain singularities in the vector potential. And so that's so-called Dirac string. Yeah, so you don't have to introduce. Yeah, so the idea is that you, what you were saying is right. The fact that you can write F as a DA means there's no magnetic source, but you can introduce a magnetic source uh, if you allow certain singularities. And, uh, uh, and that's what, the, uh, 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 what Dirac realized. Yeah. Good. So now, these are the star, these are the gauge fields in type 2a and type 2b string. And then, then they can give rise to, um, to extended objects which couple to them. And turns out the, the extended object coupled to those Ramon Ramon fields are precisely d brains. Uh, are precisely d brains. And, uh, and the, they're precisely d brains. And because they couple to those uh, uh, gauge fields, and they, uh, they are uh, a stable object. Uh, at least the minimal charge ones are stable objects, OK? Uh, and so this is related to the statement that actually in superstring you actually find some stable brains. And for other dimensions, yeah, uh, so now let me just list them just to. So, so with this pre preparation, then in 2A, so we can have the following electric and falling magnetic object. So in the 2A, we have a C mu 1. We have a 1 form. So that means there's a natural object coupled to it. Electric object coupled to it turns out this is a D0 brain. OK? A zero dimensional object coupled to a 1 form. This is a D0 brain. And so one form in 10 dimension, so in superstring we have 10 dimension, is dual to, uh, so d is 10, minus 1 is 9, minus 3 is 6. No. 
Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's six, and then the, the magnetic object will be a D6 spring. Okay. So similarly, we have a three form, and then this gives uh, an electric D2 brain and the magnetic D4 brain. Okay, magnetic D4 brain. So if you just follow this rule, so for the type to B. For the type to B, so so let me now uh, 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 first start with this C2. So this gives you a D string, one dimensional object coupled to it for the D string. And then, then, the, then the magnetic object will be a five dimensional object. It's called the D5 brain. So this string is a D1 brain. So now let's look at this four form. This four form. So uh, so called self dual. So sometimes we put a plus here to indicate this is a self dual. So let me now explain what what this self dual means. So self dual means that from C four I can construct the F five. I can construct the F five from this C four. Okay. To be a self dual form means that this form satisfies the condition. That f5 equal to f5 dual. Just this is a self dual. Just means just this is a constraint that this t has to satisfy. Right, so this is called a self dual four form. Okay. Uh, I ju that just from the uh, uh, a, a yeah. If you look at the representations of the Lorentz image, you find that this is actually a, a, a representation. And so uh, 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 so for for this c, you have to satisfy the self duality condition. Then now, for object which coupled to the C, would be a, a laterally D3 brain, because the three, four, uh, three uh, dimension object coupled to a four form, so, so it would be a D3 brain. And this D3 brain, because of this self duality condition, we have to be both electric and magnetically charged, OK? OK? Uh, because, of the, uh, um, yeah, because this is the self dual form. Uh, uh, so, so, so this so this must source both electric flux and the magnetic flux to be consistent with the uh, self duality. Okay. And uh, and finally, you can also have a scalar field in the type two B, and the scalar field naively you will couple to so called. D minus one dimensional brain, because scalar field by itself is zero dimension. Okay, it's already a zero dimensional form. So, 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 so follow this convention with couple to a D minus one dimensional brain, and uh, and that obviously does not make much sense. And uh, but but actually can be made sense when you go to Euclidean signature, and then turns out uh, uh, this uh, um, this scalar field coupled to uh, something called the instanton, uh, which I will not go into there. Uh, something called D instanton. Okay. So, so the bottom line is that the the object we are charged on the those Roman Roman field, they are all D brains. They are all D brains, and they they come into those dimensions. And uh, any D brain, of course, you can define D brains with other dimensions. So you can consider into A a D three brain, but into A a D three brain will not be a stable object. Because there's no conserved charge for it coupled to, so so even though uh, uh, in two A you can consider a D three brain, but it's not a stable object, and actually uh, when you quantize the spectrum on the D three brain in two A, then you find there's a tachyon. Again, there's a tachyon in the world volume that indicates that's not a stable object, and but those brains uh, uh, don't have uh, 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 tachyons, okay. And in particular, on those brains, it's all supersymmetric. Field series, uh, 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 for example, uh, uh, the the most important one is this D three brain, because then then you have a four dimensional world volume, then you actually have a four dimensional series on this D three brain, and uh, and that's what uh, I give you so called N equals four super Yang Mill series. Okay, so on these brains, <coughs> on these stable brains, the low energy series. Uh, super symmetric, uh, uh, 
uh, super young males three. In particular, for, for D3, it's given by so-called n D4 super young male theory in, D4, in four dimensions, OK? Four dimensions. Yeah. Yeah, it can decay. It can decay. It can. It, it actually. Um, it's possible for it to decay into lower dimensional brain. And it can also for it just to decay into closed stream modes, radiate closed stream modes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's why you, you need to have density of strings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually a beautiful subject to, to discuss those brains, how they decay. Uh, 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 um, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, one can actually do, uh, 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 um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice subject. Yeah, but it's way out of our uh, discussion here. Any questions? Yes? As before, if we consider stacks of such brains, do we yeah. get Yang Mills higher rank gauge groups? Yeah, that's right, exactly. It, it, it's always give you UN. Yeah. Good, so let's conclude our discussion of the D brains in, uh, 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 from the point of view uh, as uh, the richly boundary conditions, OK? Uh, 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 as the richly boundary conditions. So now, I want to take a slightly different perspective on the deep brains. From this perspective, from, their, from the perspective, they are objects which are charged under those generalized gauge fields. OK? Uh, and now I want to view those deep brains as some object some solitons, if you, uh, if you want, some solitons which are charged under those generalized gauge fields. OK, I, I, I want to take, I want to elaborate from this perspective. OK? All right. Talk about a different perspective. So deep brain has a mass, has a tension. Also deep brain carry, so now we only consider those stable deep brains. So they have a mass, they also carry those charges, conserved charges. So that means that there will be flux coming out, uh, electric or magnetic flux coming out of those brains. So that will deform the space time, OK? Uh, um, yeah, because the, uh, the gravitation will deform space time. And so now we'd like to find out what are the space time around those uh, deep brains. OK, how do they de uh, deform space time? So tall example, say it's consider, say consider charge uh, uh, as a tall example of this. Say let's consider just again in the Maxwell theory, in Einstein Maxwell theory, consider, for example, a charged particle. Sitting, say, at the origin, say, of a four dimensional space time, say, Minkowski space time, for example. So if you include both GR and ENM, then the dynamics of this series is controlled by so-called Einstein-Maxwell. So, so you will have uh, 
Einstein theory and the Maxwell. Okay. So the dynamics of such particles should, cap uh, should be captured by them, and so this cap so this captures the gravity due to the particle. This captures the E and M due to the particle. So from here, you can work out how does this particle, say, uh, deform space-time, OK, uh, from the Einstein equation. So, uh, so the equation motion of this system would be you have a, a, a standard Maxwell. So I will not be careful about the minus sign. Uh, and the, the, the also the Einstein equation. The stress tensor. <coughs> OK. So, so the J, so J is just the, J is just the, the um, So if I have a charged particle sitting there, there's no current. Uh, there's only a charge density. Okay. And the stress tensor contains two parts. Is the stress tensor due to the particle, and also the stress tensor due to the electromagnetic field? Okay, because this is exciting electromagnetic fields. And uh, and the uh, uh, and the particle part only have a zero zero component, so you only have a mass. There's no momentum, so this is just a say. Maybe I should write R. Yeah, I think I'm using notation of R. Okay. So the so the uh, um, the particle part of the stress tensor would be just the data function. Uh, 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 the only non-zero component are zero, zero components. Uh, you only have energy density, and it's just given by the uh, by the uh, data function of the mass. So, so, so from here, by solving those equations with those sources, then you can work out how a charged particle deforms your space-time. Okay, how a charged particle deforms your space-time. So, so let me just say a little bit further. For example, you can easily solve the Einstein equation if you allow the solutions. So you just have a Coulomb potential. You just have a Coulomb potential. And uh, and uh, and the other ones you have uh, uh, in other words you have electric flux surrounding the S2 around the point particle equal to Q. Okay? Again, this is the dual of F. Uh, uh, you have electric field. When you dual, dualize, then, then have spatial components, then that gives you the. Yeah, so this is a Gauss law, OK? This is Gauss law. And you can also work out uh, the metric uh, uh, surrounding these charged particles. So because the space time is uh, uh, symmetric, Spherical is metric, then you can actually write down a spherical symmetric ansatz for the metric around the particle. So from the Einstein equation, You can find out what you can work out what is fr and hr. Okay. So some of you may have already done this exercise before. So if your q is zero, what answer would you get? That's right. So uh, 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 if the um, q is zero, then you just get a swash of the metric. And it's exactly the uh, metric as, say, produced by a sun, et cetera, far away. Okay? 
And uh, um, so, so here we have a charge. Then what you get is something called the Raston Nordstrom uh, metric. And uh, 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 when you have a charge, you have a natural magnetic field. Okay, so, so you will get so called Ressner. Nostrum. Okay. That's a Q equals zero. Hmm? A Q equals zero. No, no, no. Well, that's the general one. Q log equal to zero is in Ressner Nostrum. And when Q equal to zero, then you just get the uh, uh, Swashield. Um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's how you calculate the uh, uh, pre precession. Yeah, that's what you use to calculate the precession of, say, of the mercury. Similarly, you can also do this for, for magnetic charge particle. So the only difference for magnetic charge particle The difference is that this equation now become just directly magnetic flux equal to g. Say, for example, if it's uh, uh, say if the uh, magnetic charge is g of charge g, and then you will get this. Then, then instead you have this, and then uh, and then you have uh, 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 um, yeah. We have a magnetic flux, and again, uh, 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 you can plug into Einstein equation. You solve, you get the same resonance uh, uh, metric. So also uh, uh, a Dirac quantization. Tell you that the QG should be quantized in integers of uh, two pi n. That n equal to one, two, etc. Okay. So this is the familiar story in the GR. So if you want to look at how uh, uh, how the gravity and uh, and E and M surrounding a charged object, and so you can generalize this story immediately to those brains which are charged which they have their own mass and charged under some, some generalized gauge field, OK? So you can generalize that immediately. So you can generalize procedure immediately to higher dimensional object. So, uh, so you can just, as a simple exercise in GR, you can just carry out this procedure just replace this to some higher dimensional form, and the, uh, and the source is some higher dimensional object, and you can work out the solutions. Okay. Um, and that was a simple exercise, which actually uh, uh, Horowitz and Strominger did in early 90s, in 1991. Yeah, it's a trivial generalization you can do. Uh, why not do it? But turns out to be, a, turns out that's a very very important step to do <laughs> uh, uh, tend, uh, uh, for the reason uh, uh, we, which I will explain. So for simplicity, let me just talk a little bit about doing this for the three brain. Also for definitely, you can do it for any of this. And then let me just say, say it for uh, to, to the three brain. So now consider say the three brain. So this ray brain is part of the type 2B theory. So of course, we don't know how to really do this in the full type 2B string. So we will do the low energy limit of type 2B string. So we will do this for the uh, uh, this ray brain in the low energy limit of type 2B string, which is so-called type 2B supergravity. OK? So, so it doesn't matter. You don't know anything about type 2B supergravity. And essentially, uh, uh, that's just some generalization of this equation. Okay, uh, a type to be so gravity, just some generalization of this equation. But then nevertheless, let me just introduce some notations just to be uh, uh, to be. Um, so type to be super gravity. Uh, 
So we will do this in the in the in the low energy limit of the two to be string. So this is the low energy factive theory. For massless modes, of to be string, okay. So it has the form as the uh, of what we have before. We have one over six pi ten pi g n, but now this is a ten-dimensional Newton constant. So this is a ten-dimensional theory. E equal to ten, and uh, and you have a, 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 a yeah you have the Einstein term, and then you have forms associated with all this flux, uh, 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 generalized gauge field, etc., fermions, etc., etc. Okay, and as we said before, the relation with string theory, the Newton constant, should be proportional to G S square. Okay. So you can actually work, the, uh, work out the prefactor uh, precisely. So let me just write down the prefactor. So the relation with the string is, yeah, just on dimensional ground. So this is the Newton constant in 10 dimension. So this would have dimension 8 in terms of the length, uh, uh, have dimension 8. So the right-hand side must be upper prime to the power 4, because this is the only length scale in string theory. And then the prefactor turned out to be, so you can work out the prefactor. So it turns out 16 pi g n is equal to 2 pi to the power 7. OK? Uh, 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 say, when you work out the low energy factor theory, you can work out this pre precise uh, factor. And the regime of the validity of this type to be supergravity is that the GS is much, much smaller than one. String coupling should be much, much smaller than one. So that just tells, this is a statement that the string loop correction should be small, because the, when the G string become big, the loop uh, correction become more, more and more important. Uh, uh, um, yeah, loop correction will be more and more important. From the point of view of gravity, uh, these are quantum gravitational corrections. And so, so when G stream becomes big, the quantum gravitational correction, so the space time will fluctuate more. And then, of course, you cannot trust the classical gravity uh, in that regime. So if you want to trust the uh, classical gravity, you want to have small coupling, or translate into this uh, language, uh, the Newton constant have to be small. OK, the Newton constant have to be small. So that means the gravity is weak. Okay? That means gravity is weak. But in real life, gravity is weak, so it's OK. And uh, so, so this means the quantum correction is small. So you can trust the classical gravity. OK, so you can trust uh, a classical gravity. And we also want the, uh, the energy, no energy. So we want the energy square to be smaller than 1 over alpha prime. Because when, when the energy square becomes of order 1 alpha prime, then the massive stream modes become important because all the massive stream modes have mass square of one of alpha prime, and if you only want to concentrate on the massless modes and you don't want to excite them, okay. And also you want the curvature of the space time. Here we're considering curved space time, so you also want the curvature to be much smaller than one of alpha prime, okay. So. Um, so this gravity, essentially, when you consider the mass of this particle, you consider the particle limit of the uh, uh, space time. So, so this can be considered, say, as that you consider the space time curvature, the space time curvature radius is much, much. So, so alpha prime essentially this gives us the rough length scale of a string. And when the curvature is much, much smaller than alpha prime, that means that the size of the string is tiny compared to the curvature radius. Okay, the typical size of your system. And that you can uh, uh, roughly treat them as point particles. And that's what the gravity theory does. Yeah, in the supergravity theory, it's all point particles, okay? 
And, uh, and so this means we decouple massive modes. OK, decouple massive modes. So you can concentrate on massive modes. So whenever you take a limit, you always have to take the dimension is number small. So the dimension is number is alpha prime times curvature, or alpha time times energy square. But in reality, we often, when we work with a theory, we often just keep our curvature or our energy scale as what we want. And then in talking about this limit, we just say we take alpha prime goes to zero limit. OK? We say we take alpha prime goes to zero limit. So that means a low energy limit. OK? Uh, even though, uh, 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 legitimately, this is not the right thing to say, because this is dimensional parameter. And so, so the regime which supergravity works can be formulated, say, as alpha prime goes to 0, and the g-string goes to 0. Okay. So, so in this regime, now you can work with supergravity, and now you can now generalize this story to the brains. Okay? Now generate this story for brains. So now let me say a few things about the D brain, a D3 brain. So D brain, D3 brain is charged under C4 plus, this C4 plus. And we said this C4 plus is required to be self-dual. That means any source of C4 plus must carry both electric and magnetic charge. So that means that for the D3 brain, Say, if you define electric charge to be, so now, so the D3 brain is a three-dimensional object. And the transverse direction is a six-dimensional, OK, because this is 3 plus 1, including time. So the transverse direction is, uh, is six-dimensional. So we can similarly just think about the, the uh, D3 brain. So if we, if we ignore the spatial direction along the brain, then, then this three brain, the transverse direction, then can be just considered a point in R6. Okay. Okay. So, so a way to think about the this three brain, uh, uh, the surrounding the this three brain, just it's analog of a point in R6, in the six-dimensional space. Is this clear? This is going to be very important. And then the surrounding this point, the sphere will be S5. Okay. Just like in the electric case. Just in the uh, uh, like E and M case, this is the S2 surrounding the point particle. And this S5 is the sphere which is surrounding the whole D3 brain. And, uh, and then this D3 brain can have electric and magnetic flux through this S5. Okay? And so electric charge would be just the five form uh, surrounding through it. And, uh, and uh, 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 um, Magnetic charge would be just uh, uh, um, right. One is the dual of f of five form is one is form. Just just like the relation between these two. Okay. And now because of self duality condition, then it must be the same. So that means for this three brain, the electric and the magnetic charge must be the same. And also the for a higher dimensional object. Excuse me, why, why this should be the same? Why not? It's because F5, you could do F5 star. Oh. It's because of that. Because of that. Self dual condition. Yeah. So electric and magnetic charge of the D3 wave must be the same. They must carry both electric and magnetic charge. And now this Dirac quantization condition also works for higher dimensional object. 
And again, it's a very simple uh, uh, exercise to do it. A uh, 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 very simple exercise to general, uh, generalize the rocks argument to higher dimension. Again, it just uh, related how you treat those uh, higher dimensional forms, etc. Again, it's a very simple step, but it's a very important step. So that tells me that for this three brain, which is self-dual, which is carry both in natural and magnetic charge, then you have to satisfy this uh, uh, quantization condition. Then that means the minimal single D3 brain, the minimal charged object, must be the charge must be square root 2 pi. OK? And for n of them, so it must be G3 equal to Q3 equal to 2 pi. So, so now we have specified the analog for the for E and M those conditions, okay? For e and, uh, uh, now we also have to specify the mass of the D three brain. So as we discussed before, tension of the D three brain, tension of a D brain, should be proportional to one of G string, okay? Uh, 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 that uh, you also did in your P sets. And again, you can. By doing a precise calculation, you can work out the precise prefactors. It turns out, it turns out actually to be the following form. Uh, to be the following form is the Q3 divided by 16 pi gn. Okay, and uh, and the gn is uh, g g string square. So if you translate into so for n this brain, then would be n divided by Q pi Q G S alpha prime square. Okay, so so this G S uh, by alpha prime square we know on general ground. So G S with one over G S we know on general ground, and alpha prime square just from dimensional analysis, because this is a three-dimensional object. The tension is a tension will have mass dimension four, so that's why you have one over alpha prime square here, and then then the other two pi cube from precise calculation, and you can also write it in this form. So in terms of Newton constant, okay. And uh, the reason I write this form because this is a very special uh, uh, case, and uh, you see that the, the tension is actually precisely related to the charge uh, and divided by the square root of Newton constant. And turns out that only special object, only special object uh, uh, have this kind of property. Uh, and this so-called BPS object, uh, I will not go to there. It's related to those brains are supersymmetric. Anyway, so so these are the uh, mass of the uh, essentially this is uh, the mass of the brain, and uh, these are the charge of the brain. When you specify the charge, then those fields, then those flux are uniquely determined, and then then the then the C four potential are uniquely determined, uh, uh, up to gauge symmetry uh, are, are determined, and then now you can plug into the generalization of the Einstein equation to work out the geometry. Okay. So, so again, the symmetry here, yeah, I won't have time for the bottom line, so that's okay. Um, so the symmetry, preserved by the D-brain, by this brain as we said before, similar to all D-brains, is you have a Poincare symmetry along the brain direction, and then you have rotation symmetry in the transverse direction along the brain. So the transverse, we have six dimensions. So there's SO6 uh, directions you can rotate in the, uh, and then, uh, then you have Poincare symmetry in the one, three direction. So based on these symmetries, you can write down what the metric looks like. You can write down answers for the metric. Okay, just like what here, you can write down the answers for the, uh, for the metric of a point particle ba based on symmetry. So here you can uh, uh, write down the answers uh, 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 for the metric based on symmetry. So first, you should have a part which is preserve Poincare symmetry. Means this part can only be this form, say along the brain direction, can only be uh, 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 this form times some overall factor 
which depend on R. So R is the transverse radius from the brain. And then the, the other dimension must be, then the other dimension must be uh, spherically symmetric. So you can have a lot of factors. And then the R square and the R square, the omega 5 square. So this is S5 surrounding the brain. And then this is the radial direction. So this is the only uh, 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 form of the metric. And essentially, again, as in the charged particle case, you need to determine these two functions, OK? Which you can plug in the Einstein equation, just determine these two functions. So let me just write down the form of those functions, and then we discuss what they mean uh, 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 next time. Somehow, this year, I'm consistently much, much slower than what I did before. Maybe I'm explaining physics better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, so, so now it's just a mechanical exercise. You plug in these answers into the Einstein equation. Then you can find the two equations for, for f and the h. Then you can solve it. In the old days, when Horowitz and Schrominger did it, uh, uh, maybe, they don't, maybe they did not have Mathematica yet. But nowadays, you can do it. Using Mathematica, if you have the right program, you can do it in five minutes. But in their old days, uh, they were friends with Wolfram. Maybe they already have the uh, uh, program <laughs> at that time. Anyway, so, so it was a, 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 a more longevous exercise to do at the time. So you find, actually, the answer is very simple. Turns out, both f and h, they just yeah, uh, 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 can be written in the following form. So h. So h is another function. H is just a harmonic function. And r to the power 4 is given by some constant, some constant gn, Newton constant, times the disrepresent tension times n, and it can also be written as 4 pi. GSN alpha prime square. OK? So it turns out that those functions are very simple. They're just square root of a harmonic function. So this is a harmonic function for the transverse R6. So if you solve, uh, say, a, 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 a coolant problem, and, uh, and that would be the solution. Uh, 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 this is the harmonic. Yeah, this, so this is a generalization of 1 over R potential. So this is just a generalization of 1 over R potential. And then f and g is very simply related to this uh, by square root. And this, uh, uh, this constant r to the power 4, so this is not curvature. This is just some constant. Uh, stand, uh, 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 I'm using the standard notation. And then this can be, uh, uh, this is just related to the mass of the brain. A uh, 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 mass of the brain, of course, is proportional to n. Um, yeah? In this case, it's the mass, so it's the, the charge is the mass. Of it. Sorry? Okay. The charge is massive. Yeah. Uh, uh, sorry? The okay. Is the charge considered on the D3 brain? Yeah. Massless or massive? No, no, no. Charge, charge are just charge. Uh, what do you mean by charge is the massive? Um, okay. Yeah, this is just a charge carried by D3 brain. Oh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, so, so this R4 is just like Gn times the tension. Uh, uh, n times the tension, we have n, uh, uh, n object just, yeah, so this is what you're familiar with with the Schwarzschild black hole. Uh, Schwarzschild metric just Newton constant times mass. So this is just generalization of that. The Newton constant times the tension. And you have n branch, which just multiply n. And you can write it, uh, if you write everything in terms of gs, this is proportional to gs square. This is proportional to 1 over gs. So then end up, this thing is proportional to gs. OK? OK, I will stop here.